what I want to do is do live lectures periodically. Lectures are things that some of us like to go to, some of us loathe. I pride myself on giving fun, entertaining lectures, but I haven't been able to give any because of this whole COVID stuff. I want to give more lectures, so I'm going to be doing these regularly. I'd like to do them every week if possible, but you know how life gets. So let's say every other week you can expect a lecture from me. I'll try to get some guests on as well so that we mix it up. You don't have to look at uh, me all the time. And, um, and we'll vary the topics. Sometimes I'll let you vote. I'll say, what do you want to do? And I'll come up with a lecture for it. Sometimes I just have a lecture that I've given before that people really enjoy. So on that note, just looking down, I see that Bedside Rounds is here. Raheem is here. Your doc is here, your doc Lincoln. What I'm going to do is I just want to represent. Yesterday I asked people whether or not I should dress up or go like a slob. I went right down the middle. I went right down the middle. I dressed up a little bit, mostly because I've been watching this show called The Great, which is phenomenal. And uh, I'm really into like this Russian colonialism look, um, and that's what I'm going for. But it's too hot, so I'm just going to take that off. I'm just going to go back to looking like a slob and representing New York. My hometown. All right, so we're going to get started here. Let me ask you first, before we get started, I'm going to try and just go through this lecture. It should be 20 minutes long, and then we're going to stop. We're going to do q and I think that's the best way of doing it. Because of the lag and because of questions and rhythm, I don't want to stop in the middle, take questions, and keep going. The lecture's short enough that I think you can get through it, and uh, let's see how this goes. But if there's something glaringly obvious, if, um, if I have something hanging on my nose or the audio drops off, please just text me. I'm keeping it on the feed, and, um, and I really appreciate it. And then we'll make adjustments from there. All right, so let me get into the presentation. And what I want to do is every talk that I've given, most every talk has an inspiration for it. And this talk was inspired by actual events that happened to me during residency or during my first day of fellowship, I should say. I was a pretty cocky resident. I did an EMIM residency. And when I was done, I went to do a critical care fellowship. And I'll be honest with you, I kind of thought I knew everything when I was going into fellowship. And it's completely wrong when it came to that. My first day of fellowship, I showed up, uh, shirt, tie, pressed pants, the whole nine, like you, you normally do, want to impress everybody. We finished rounds, and I got my first page of fellowship. And it was the emergency department calling to tell me that they were sending up a patient with COPD, they told me she looked terrible, diaphoretic, she's on BPAP, and she's coming upstairs. Now, I trained in a very busy hospital, and I was used to consults being a little bit of banter between the consultant and the consultee. And so I asked a couple questions back, you know, you know, what comorbidities does she have? Uh, does she have any cats, any allergies? I don't know, just stupid stuff, stuff you really shouldn't be doing as a consultant on the phone. But I did it because I thought that's the way you do things. But every time I asked a question, there'd be silence. And so three or four questions deep, I said, hello? And I realized they had already hung up the phone. They had long given up on me, and they were sending the patient upstairs because my, that hospital, like most hospitals, they're not asking for permission to go to the ICU. They're telling you the patient's coming. And literally... Five to ten minutes later, the patient was turning the corner, coming into the ICU at a brisk pace, and she was looking terrible. She was on non-invasive, she was diaphoretic, and they rolled her into the room, and the nurse waved me over and said, you know, what are we going to do for this person? Now, she was on 10 over 5 of non-invasive, and she looked horrible, and I didn't really know what to do next. I didn't know what settings to do, so I just did my best doctor impression. I put the stethoscope on, I started auscultating the lung, and um, got to be honest with you, I was trying to buy some time. The respiratory therapist said to me, you know, Dr. Malamat, what do you want to do? And I said, you know, I'm examining the lungs over here. I got maybe 30 more seconds until she said back to me, Dr. Malamat, what do you want to do? What settings do you want? And so I took off my glasses. I gave her a very academic stare. And I said, what settings do you want to do? She looked back at me. And what I didn't realize it was her first day of on the job training and so she looked back at me and she said well what do you want to do and this went back and forth a few times until finally I said fine I'll make a decision we're on 15 over 5 let's go to 15 over 10 and we waited just a little bit and um, nothing happened the patient looked exactly the same looked terrible well, what do you want to do now well naturally go up to 20 over 15 
I thought. And so we went up to 2015, nothing happened. The patient still looked horrible. And then we took the patient up to 25 over 20, and now things started happening. The patient became bradycardic, hypoxemic, and coded. Very first day of fellowship, my patient coded on me. That is, for those playing at home, that is a bad way to start your first day of fellowship. Well, luckily we got her back, and I realized after that I didn't know jack about non-invasive ventilation. So I went on to create what I think is a good rule of thumb for managing patients who are in respiratory distress. And so let me get the slides going here, and then we'll talk a little bit about my approach to non-invasive ventilation. And what I want to do is I wanted to make, I really want to make everything in medicine super duper simple. I believe that critical care is one of those things where you have to think quick on your feet, you have to know a lot of stuff, but you need very simple pathways to take care of people, and then as things unfold, you can start to make adjustments. And so this is what I call respiratory failure made ridiculously simple. Now, many of you watching, I recognize some of the names, I know that you are high quality, highly trained professionals. We know how to take care of most respiratory emergencies. 95% of the stuff we know how to deal with. But there are some patients who come in who are not exactly sure what's going on. And what I want to do is provide you an algorithmic approach to, to taking care of these people, even when you don't know exactly what's going on right up front. And this is the rule of twos. And some of you might have heard me talk about it before, but till this day, I truly believe that this is the simplest way to approach a patient with respiratory failure. So let me talk a little bit about this. Everything that I'm going to talk about today, the answer is going to be two. No tricks up my sleeve. I'm not trying to catch you at home. The answer is going to be two for everything I ask you. So when I say how many types of respiratory failure are there, there's only two. There's a failure to oxygenate, and there's a failure to ventilate. So we'll start off with the first one. We'll talk about type 1 respiratory failure, a hypoxemic respiratory failure. Not enough oxygen is getting into that blood. And the second type we'll talk about, or type 2 respiratory failure, is a hypercarbic respiratory failure or a failure to ventilate. Only two types of respiratory failures, but you got to know which one the patient's dealing with so you know what to do for that person. When you have somebody who is a hypoxemic or a type 1 respiratory failure, guess how many ways you can take care of them? There's really only two things you can do. The first thing that you can do is you can crank up the FiO2. That's the easy thing. That's what we all do. But what's harder is what comes next. We sometimes forget about the fact that we can increase our mean airway pressure. The amount of positive pressure that's in the airways, that's going to open up the alveoli that have collapsed down. Type 1 respiratory failures are things like pulmonary edema, pneumonia, uh, early ARDS, or, or late ARDS. But what happens is those alveoli compress down, and now you can't oxygenate the blood. Mean airway pressure, positive expiratory pressure, or and positive airway pressure, all the same things. Increase the alveoli, get them back into involved gas exchange so you can decrease your hypoxemia. So two ways to fix a type 1 problem. Type 2 problem, a failure to ventilate too much CO2 in the blood, there's only two ways you can take care of that problem. You could increase the tidal volume so every breath releases more CO2, or you can increase the respiratory rate. Essentially, respiratory rate and tidal volume are the minute ventilation together, and increase in minute ventilation is going to clear out CO2. So there's only two ways to fix that problem. Now, there are going to be situations where you have a concurrence of both of these problems. Let's say you have somebody who has a pneumonia, and they also have some background COPD, and they've been working so hard to breathe that now they're getting fatigued. So they may have a problem of oxygenation with the pneumonia, and they may have a failure of respiration or ventilation with the COPD exacerbation. There, we're going to talk about therapies that you can use for both, but the primary thing I want you to remember is you have to distill down what the primary problem is. It's going to help you to titrate your non-invasive ventilation settings. If you don't know what the primary problem is and you're just slinging around settings like I was doing, you're going to find yourself in a whole world of trouble for that person because you're not treating their problem primarily. Now, it's Friday. You guys are tired. I know you had long weeks. I am not going to bore you with lots of physiology. In fact, this is probably as deep physiologically we're going to get. But these are the building blocks for everything that we're going to talk about. So if we don't understand this, everything else is going to fall apart. And, you know, hopefully it's going to be pretty straightforward. Rule of twos, the only two things you need to know. Now, everyone wants to talk about invasive positive pressure ventilation. But to tell you the truth, that is very, very easy. If you understand this, 
everything about non-invasive ventilation, you'll understand everything about positive pressure ventilation. And maybe next week or the week after, the next thing that I do, we'll do invasive. And I'll just I'll do a quick summary, but you'll see it's pretty much just the same. Now, there's only two types of non-invasive pressure ventilation, two categories. There's continuous positive airway pressure, and there's BPAP, or bi-level positive airway pressure. And we'll go into these in some detail. Again, I'm never here to trick you. I'm just here to teach. Here's a case of a six-year-old person with a history of CHF who maybe or maybe not has taken their medicines, uh, their Lasix, over the past couple weeks. And here they come to you. They're short of breath. And here's the x-ray that you find. Now, I know many of you newbies don't really know what a chest x-ray is because you're always using ultrasound. So I got you covered. Don't you worry. There you go. There's the ultrasound. Bilateral B lines, for those of you who don't know what that is, this is the visual representation of Rawls. And so you see B lines everywhere, which means the whole lung is wet, and then throw in there a little echo. And what you see here is that LV, that LV is not working very well. So this is acute decompensated heart failure. And this is a problem of oxygenation. So it is a hypoxemia or hypoxemic type problem. So for this, you're going to use continuous positive area pressure or CPAP. Because what you need, type 1 problem, is to increase the FiO2. Again, just crank up the dial. That's easy. But what do you do when the person's still hypoxemic? You have to splint open the airways. You have to open them up so there's better gas exchange. CPAP in patients who have acute decompensated heart failure is good for a variety of reasons. It reduces preload. So remember, when you have somebody who has heart failure, there's too much blood going through that pulmonary circuit. By giving them positive pressure, you're making the intrathoracic space more positive, decreasing blood flow from the right heart into the left heart, and decreasing the pulmonary edema that is there. If you ever have a balloon, if you ever have kids, you'll, you'll feel me on this one. I hate birthday parties. I mean, I, I like birthday parties. I love going to them. I love cake. But the problem with birthday parties is that I'm always designated with the task of blowing up the balloons. And just stick with me. It's, it's important. The reason why I hate blowing up balloons is because that first part of the balloon is the hardest thing. I feel like my ears are going to pop out. And then once you get past that initial inflation, it's much easier to blow up that balloon. Well, the same thing is true of the lungs. If you have alveoli that are collapsed down because they're inflamed or they have fluid in there, those alveoli are now collapsed down. It takes a lot of energy expenditure to open up those alve alveoli. But if you don't provide end expiratory pressure to those airways and you bring it down to zero, the pressure down to zero, what happens? At the end of the breath, those alveoli collapse down again. And then that person has to generate a lot of force to open up those alveoli. Not to mention that it causes some injury to those alveoli by stretching and de-recruiting and stretching and de-recruiting, but it also causes an incredible amount of fatigue for that person. So it increases your work of breathing when you collapse down. So by providing end expiratory pressure, you deflate the balloon, but just enough so it stays open on that hard initial part, and then it's easier to ventilate that person again, another benefit of it. The next thing, well, it decreases your work of breathing, and that's kind of what we just spoke about. The last thing is that it increases your FRC, your functional residual capacity. And the simplest analog to this um, that I can prescribe is this is your physiologic reserve tank in your car. You know, whenever I'm driving, I see the E on the car. I just, I shake it off because I know I probably have like 10 or 15 more miles because I know I have a reserve tank. Well, the same thing is true of your FRC. When you get hypoxemic, when you get sick, what keeps you from dropping your SATs is this FRC. And your FRC collapses down when you're sick, when you're supine, when you have fluid in your lungs. And by giving positive end expiratory pressure, you're recruiting back that FRC. So if you go to intubate this person, they have a little bit more stability on that ventilation curve. So that's continuous positive airway pressure. There's two ways that you can apply it. We can use nasal cannula, and we can use that tight-fitting mask that goes around the nose and mouth, or just around the nose, or those CPAP hoods that you've seen now with all this COVID stuff, although it's hard to find those in this country. And I'm just going to ask you, just go ahead and tell me if you're still with me here because uh, people have uh, not been commenting. I just want to make sure that we're on, on pace, but uh, I'll keep going. All right. So... CPAP, nasal cannula. You're thinking a nasal cannula, two liters, can be continuous positive air pressure? No. We're not talking about conventional, conventional oxygen via nasal cannula. We're talking about high-flow humidified nasal cannula. And if you've been playing along this week on Instagram, you follow me on Instagram, right? 
I hope you do. We've been doing a lot of high flow the past two weeks. Today we had the five for Friday, and um, we did uh, some review on that. Now, high flow nasal cannula is a, a superb therapy, and we're not going to talk about it in COVID and whatnot, but there's just so many good benefits for it. And if you're not using it, get familiar with it because it is a superb therapy um, for your patients. Now, here's how it breaks down with high flow. There's three things you're going to titrate with your high flow. The first is simply your FiO2. Any oxygen therapy, you should be able to dial up and down your FiO2. The second thing is because it's a lot of airflow, sometimes up to 60, maybe 80 liters per minute, it can dry out the nasal mucosa so it's warm, heated, and humidified. Now, one of the benefits of that is that for people who are having um, a lot of mucus production from whatever their process is, a bronchitis or a pneumonia, this humidified air is going to promote mucus clearance from the airways. Um, and so that's another benefit of that. Increased mucosillary clearance in addition to the fact that it makes the nasal mucosa warm and dry so you don't get epistaxis. Imagine if you were getting 60 liters of minute of dry air, your nose would start bleeding, might even explode in a couple minutes of being on the therapy. But the magic of a high flow, the thing that people talk about is the liters per minute. And high flow starts at 20 liters per minute. So it's not low flow, it's high flow. High flow starting at 20 liters per minute. This flow has a variety of benefits. One of them is the fact that it causes CO2 washout. When someone's in respiratory stress, they have a lot of CO2 buildup in their nasopharynx. By providing the high flow, you allow it to clear out. So that's a benefit of it. Another benefit of it is that when you have somebody who's in respiratory distress, they are breathing with a minute ventilation that is much faster than the wall oxygen can provide. So someone who's in respiratory stress, we'll just use some round numbers here, although my math is pretty terrible. Let's say you're breathing at a rate of... Um, uh, 50 breaths per minute. That's that's crazy high, right? Oh, man. I, I'm, I'm going to paint myself into a corner here because my math isn't so good. So here we go. I'm going to do it right here. All right. Let's say you have 40 breaths per minute and they're breathing, breathing um, 500 cc's. Okay. That's 20 liters per minute of their minute ventilation. That nasal cannula that you're providing can only get up to 15 liters, maybe a little higher with flush rate. But the point is, is that as that person's breathing in, they're pulling in they're pulling in environmental air as well, and that's diluting the 100% FiO2 that you're giving. But when you give them high flow and you start at 20 liters per minute, you're matching their minute ventilation. You're matching their respiratory needs with the oxygen. That's a good thing. So remember that high flow humidified nasal cannula gives you that benefit of matching their flow. So it's a really good thing to keep in mind. So you can titrate the FiO2, you can give it more in the humidified air, and you can do the liters per minute. Oh, the other thing with high flow is that the higher the flow, the more mean airway pressure you create. Higher flow, more positive pressure in the airway. Now, what does that mean exactly? Well, we're not exactly sure. It depends on the patient's habitus, uh, physiologic needs, a whole bunch of things. Somewhere between one and eight centimeters of water is how much positive and expiratory pressure it provides, depending on the resource that you read. So this to me is not the tight-fitting mask. This is like diet CPAP, if you will. This is when I have somebody who doesn't need the tight-fitting mask but just needs something. I'll put this on and give them a try. And for many people, because of the washout and the FO2 and the mean airway pressure, it turns them around. So it's a really nice therapy. Okay, let's talk about the tight-fitting mask. These are things you know. You've used them before. Paramedics bring these patients in all the time. They're these tight-fitting masks. They're very claustrophobic, but you can generate much higher levels of pressure. And these are these masks that you see right here. Now, those masks over time, you may have seen them now in this COVID times when people are having um, CPAP on for a while, but they create ulcerations and pressure necrosis on the face. And these can be... Um, disfiguring for people and, and cause big problems. So people have come up with these other designs like a mask that you can put around the side of the face that distributes the pressure as you see here. That's one thing. And then this has been getting around there, but this is true. This is called the CPAP hood, which was very, which is very popular in Europe, and we don't have FDA approval here in the States, but many places are getting it just because of this whole COVID um, outbreak. And we can talk about that during the discussions, but this is a really nice therapy. It's comfortable for the person. It's not as claustrophobic as the tight-fitting mask. I like it because if I have a patient who is very chatty and wants to continue in conversation, I could just take it and zip it right up and say, Mr. Smith, time for some more therapy. But in all seriousness, 
it is a very nice way of not putting pressure on the face and generates high levels of pressure. So I believe the COVID epidemic is going to make these much more mainstream and, and, and um, pat, bypass some of the FDA approval, and we'll get there soon. Now, where do you start your CPAP at? We could debate this for days. I just keep it really simple. I start five centimeters of water, and I titrate by three to five every 15 minutes. This person's sick. I'm not leaving their bedside, so I'm going to park myself by them and watch them. And the maximum pressure you want to give is 20 centimeters of water. And people say, well, why do you maximize yourself? Just keep going. Go up to, like, infinity pressure. The thing is, is that the lower esophageal sphincter has an intrinsic tone of 23 to 25. And if I start going above 20, I run the risk of getting air down into the esophagus, into the stomach, insufflating that stomach, and increasing the risk of aspiration. Let me tell you that aspiration and a hypoxic respiratory failure, you don't want those two things together. One is enough. All right, let's talk a little bit about case number two. This is the patient that I got my first day of fellowship. So a 60-year-old lady, COPD, working to breathe, and this is what you see. Hyperinflated lungs, this is a bread and butter classic COPD exacerbation. So for this person, it's a type two respiratory failure. Remember, they're having a difference, they're having a problem with expelling CO2, so we're gonna need to ventilate them a little more. And for this, we're gonna use BPAP, or bi-level positive pressure ventilation. Just a medical trivia for you. BiPAP is actually a trade name. So when you walk around asking for BiPAP, it is a trademark name for a certain company. Um, if you really want to be academic, say bi-level or BPAP. Now, here's the magic of BPAP. It's what you'd expect. It's two pressures. There's an inspiratory positive airway pressure and an expiratory positive airway pressure. The inspiratory positive airway pressure, the IPAP, is what happens when the person takes a breath. When the person takes a breath, the machine provides a positive pressure. And then when the person releases the breath, what happens is it doesn't, it can go down to zero if you want to, but you can also give it an EPAP or a PEEP, if you will. The way I like to think about this is if you've ever been to the gym, and as you can tell, I don't really hit the gym, but I see people at the gym and people usually ask me to do this. It's to be a spotter. BPAP is a spotter for your respiratory system. What happens is that if you remember those, those guys and the gals in the gym, they're lifting weights, they initiate the rep. Right? So they initiate the rep, and as a spotter, you assist them to finish the rep, and then they go down. They initiate the rep, you help them out and go down. So the IPAP is the assist that you're helping with them for that rep, and then on the way down, it's the EPAP. This is the same way that this is the same way that BPAP works for patients. Now, the difference between these two is called the pressure support. Essentially, that's the tidal volume. The bigger your delta between your IPAP and your EPAP, the bigger tidal volume you get. If you have pressures that are by delta of 1, 6 over 5, you're not going to get much tidal volume. But 10 over 5 or 15 over 5, you're getting increasingly more tidal volume as you make the difference, the gradient between those two pressures. So as you can see, BPAP is helpful for people who have a type 2 respiratory failure because you can work on that tidal volume aspect of things. You can increase that tidal volume. Now, most people who come in are in respiratory distress. Their respiratory rate is already high, but you could put in a respiratory rate if you want to on many of these BPAP machines. Now, it also allows you the ability to titrate oxygenation as well. So remember when we had that problem, that person with the pneumonia and the COPD? Well, you can provide them some oxygenation in addition to their delta for their respiration. You can crank up the FF2, and remember, your mean airway pressure is essentially your EPAP. So if you have a problem with oxygenation and a problem with ventilation, now you know what parameters to titrate. So if you increase your EPAP and now the oxygenation is okay, but the person's still hypoventilating, increase your delta while keeping your EPAP the same. And we can talk about a little bit about this during the Q&A session. So what are the settings that you start at? I'm simple, I start five, you know, five to, um, um, I start my settings at five centimeters of water, and I'll explain why in a second. Um, and you can go up to 20. 20 is the highest range for the same reasons we spoke about with CPAP. You don't want to induce insufflation of the stomach and potentially aspiration. Your EPAP, I start at zero sometimes. If the person has a COPD exacerbation, I don't want to put a lot of positive pressure into their chest. So you could start them technically at 5 over 0, which is going to be the same thing for that person as 10 over 5, except you're not giving them any positive pressure ventilation. Okay. So again, 5 over 0 gets you the same delta as 10 over 5. You're going to get the same amount of tidal volume 
The only difference between the two is with the 10 over 5, you're putting more positive pressure in the chest. Now, if they have a problem with oxygenation, because most COPD patients don't, then you can start them at 10 over 5. Now, some respiratory therapists, they don't like to start at zero. They, they think you need some peep, or, or they don't like zeep. Zeep is zero peep. And so for those people, I just say, fine, let's put them on, a, on an EPAP of one. Okay, I get a little snarky. I say, let's go six over one. The point is, is that for someone who's not intubated, you do not have to be on any EPAP at all. So you don't have to start on a something over five. It can be over zero as long as they don't need any oxygenation. And then you're going to stand there and titrate at the bedside. So just as a review, let's look at what happened to my patient before. Remember, uh, Mr. Know-it-all, um, first day of fellowship, thought he knew what he was doing. Went 10 over 5, 15 over 10, 20 over 15, 25 over 20, and then the patient coded. Well, nothing happened because there was no delta in the air and the in the pressures. But what happened was the positive pressure in her chest was so increased that it caused an obstructive shock, decreased cardiac feeling, and that's why she went to respiratory arrest. You may have seen this before. You may have seen patients who come in with COPD, they were short of breath, and then they collapsed and CPR started. Disconnecting the person from the endotracheal tube, pushing on their chest is going to let some of that air come out and relieve the obstruction. So don't forget about this dynamic hyperinflation that happens with people with COPD, and that's how it happens. Now, I have a lot of patients that come in, and we try to be aggressive about putting the tight-fitting masks on, but the patients say, I feel like I'm drowning. Doc, I don't want that therapy. One time, a patient even said, don't put that therapy on me, just intubate me. And I said, that's kind of extreme, ma'am. I mean, let's just give you a try on this non-invasive, and she wanted to be intubated. What we don't realize is that these patients come in, and they slap the mask on their face. They time down. They push it down. It's very, very anxiety-provoking. So one technique you can do is to start low and titrate slow. Let me tell you what I mean by that. I give the patient the mask when they roll in. I say, here's the mask. I want you to hold it in your hand. You are empowered. And when you're ready, hold it up to your face. The settings I start off are very low. I start on three centimeters of water for the person. And I let it hold up to their face, take it down when they feel like they need to. And then over time, I ask them to hold it a little bit more continuously. And I sneak the bands over their head, and then I start titrating it up. Once you do that and you gain the trust in your patients, it is a much better therapy for them and they don't have that PTSD from the last time they were there. So give that a try. I'm not saying you do this over six hours. You can do it over 15 minutes, but just giving the patient the mask and starting slowly empowers them and takes away that anxiety about being drowned. Since we're talking about non-invasive and the things you should use it for, we should talk about some of the contraindications. Anyone who's altered and can't clear out their secretions is not a person you want to put on non-invasive. Anyone who's actively vomiting is someone you don't want to put on, on anyone who's vomiting, you don't want to put them on non-invasive. Anyone with secretions that they can't keep up with where they're continuously suctioning, non-invasive is not a good idea for, for you. They're going to aspirate. It's just going to end badly. And then anyone who has an upper airway obstruction, if they have angioedema or they have some laryngeal cancer and that's known, they have upper airway obstruction. Be very careful before you initiate non-invasive ventilation. And then there's a bunch more people that we should really think about skipping non-invasive and going right to intubation. And those are patients with hemodynamic instability. I used to think it was a really good idea not to intubate people who were in shock. I said, if I can keep them extubated, things will go better for them. The truth is, that's not the truth. What happens when somebody's in, in shock and they are acidotic is they're working very hard to breathe. They're working very hard to stay alive. And a significant portion of their cardiac output, some people say up to 80%, is just going to the respiratory muscles. And that means it's starving other essential organs of blood flow. So putting patients on uh, non-invasive, you run the risk of doing that. Intubating, sedating, paralyzing that person allows cardiac output to go to other parts of the body, and that's just a good idea when someone's in shock. Similarly, patients with high illness scores, Apache scores, SOFA scores, it's kind of the same thing as before. The sicker they are, the better off you are intubating and taking away their work of breathing and controlling their acidosis with the ventilator. Patients with moderate to severe ARDS also should be intubated early on. Um, we're not going to talk about COVID specifically. It's kind of a separate thing, but I'll tell you that a lot of, many times I'll see patients who are really sick, wide out of the lungs, and non-invasive is started. And those patients will hang on, but it's just a matter of time before they get intubated. Those people are going to get a lot sicker before they get better. So it's much wiser, in my opinion, to intubate them early when you're not doing a crash intubation so those patients can be done safely without desaturation. 
And finally, it's a minor point, but one I think that's worth saying is that every time you put somebody on non-invasive, whether that's CPAP or BPAP, I start an internal clock in my head. I give them an expiration date. No, no, no not like they're going to expire date. I, I just say, I'm going to give this person 45 minutes. And I'm going to be as aggressive and maximum as possible. And if I could turn them around in 45 minutes, awesome. But if I can't and I've done everything, then it's going to be time to intubate them. Because what I've been guilty of so many times is putting them someone on non-invasive, coming back in half an hour and saying, mm, I'm just going to give them another half hour. Mm, 15 more minutes. Mm, 45 more minutes. What happens is that person is already declining and now I have to do a crash intubation. Set your limit, be aggressive, and then if that person doesn't get better and is getting worse despite maximum therapy, they're probably not going to get better and they probably need a tube. So let's just bring it back home and talk about the rule of twos. Respiratory failure made ridiculously simple. And all you have to remember is that there are two types of respiratory failure. A failure to oxygenate, a failure to ventilate. A failure to oxygenate is two things you need to do. Increase the FiO2, but more importantly, don't forget about increasing the mean airway pressure. And if it's a failure to ventilate, increase your CO2 clearance by increasing your tidal volume or increasing your respiratory rate. Together, that's your minute ventilation. Non-invasive, there's two types of non-invasive. There's CPAP, continuous positive airway pressure, for people with type 1 respiratory failures, failure to oxygenate. It's not going to work for type 2 respiratory failures, failures of ventilation. For that, you need BPAP. Now, you can use BPAP for patients who have type 1 problems as long as you know what you're titrating. Remember, the delta is going to give you your, your pressure support, your tidal volume, and it's that EPAP that's going to give you the oxygenation for that person. CPAP, you can use that humidified nasal cannula, great therapy, maybe we'll talk about it in the discussions, or you can use the tight-fitting mask or even that hood. BPAP, there's only one way of doing it. Um, it's with uh, the tight-fitting mask, um, and remember, there's two different names for it. All right, I'm going to hold it there. I'm going to switch over and take some questions from you. I hope this is helpful. Uh, and for those of you that kind of know this, I've had a couple people tell me that this is a better way to teach medical students and residents um, and even fellows. It just puts it into a very straightforward context so that when you have that person that's falling apart in front of you, you have to figure out what type of respiratory problem they have and then what therapy you're going to use for it. So thank you very much. And let's flip over and let's take some questions. And I know there's a little bit of a delay. So I'm just going to do a Christopher Walken impression. I'm just kidding. I'm not going to do it, although I really want to. Maybe if you ask, I will. All right, people. What questions you got for me? Hit me. I'm just going to flip cameras here. I hope I didn't lose you guys. I've just been talking to myself. Definitely wouldn't be the first time. <laughs> Do it. You now, Christopher Walken, bringing chips and guac. Doing a live lecture. Respiratory failure. Ridiculously simple. There you go, Alan. That's what I got. I'm... Somehow I do it better when uh, there's an audience. But um, any questions, anybody? We can really talk about anything you want. It's all fair game. Oh, thanks. Thanks, Michael. I appreciate that. I've been trying. I've been trying real hard. All right, let's see what we got here. More cowbell. I got a fever. I need more cowbell. That's getting better now. I'm going to read these like Chris Falken. Thoughts on how to, how long to let a patient go before pulling the trigger to intubate. Wow. That's a good question. Um, honestly, it, it really depends. I don't have a, a limit um, that I prescribe to everybody. Every patient is different. So if I have somebody who is, let's just say, acute pulmonary edema. Thanks for the question, Jeff. I appreciate it. If I have somebody who has acute pulmonary edema, I know what I need to do. I need to crank up a nitro drip on that patient. I need to 
get the person on non-invasive ventilation. I might even consider some diuresis in you know, 30, 45 minutes, maybe some afterload reduction. Once I do that though, once I get past that and the person's still looking crummy, I have nothing left to do. So in my mind, I'm just hoping. I'm just hoping the person doesn't get better. Even though I know I'm maximal here, the patient's not gonna get better. And if I see the patient declining, if I see them start to, to fatigue and go down, that's my signal to tell me that that person needs to be intubated. If they're keeping up with things, they're alert, they're, they're a little snarky with me, I'll give them some more time. But once they start turning that corner, I just haven't seen people turn around and bounce back. The respiratory system, it's running a marathon. And once it fatigues, I like to intubate them ahead of time and, um, and, and get ahead of them. That's just my personal, that's my personal preference. Um, all right. What else do you got? Oh, we got Lars Peterson here. Hey, Lars. I appreciate the compliment. Wow. been working quarantine has um has brought out the walk in me chips and guac <sighs> bedside rounds has taken off he's working he's still put out the time to uh to come on i appreciate you bedside rounds big fan uh okay alan says do you check a gas um uh, before uh wearing bpap i got i'll tell you that I'll, I might do a venous blood gas on a person. I don't know if gases really help me all that much. I do a lot of assessment with what's in front of me, the clinical state of the person. And if the I might get a gas initially after starting my therapy to see if I get some delta. So I might have the initial blood gas. Um, again, I'll try for a venous gas. And then after that, I'll do another one to see I'm moving in the right direction. But Sometimes you get these gases that are really head scratchers. It says greater than 95, and you're like, the person's still talking to me. I don't know what to do about that. I just keep going with them. Um, it's, you know, it's sometimes these gases delay your actions. They create a lot of confusion, and I much rather assess the person clinically for intubation um, with what I'm seeing in front of me. Um, I know other people that do gases, and I don't think they're wrong for doing them. I just... I just don't think they've helped me out very much. So I, I really try to go clinical on that. Look at this. As I'm sitting there, blah, 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 Alan says, look what he says. I'm more of a guy that goes beyond the clinical picture. Recent IBCC suggests Farkas and Adam Thomas didn't check gas either. Okay, well, if those guys don't do it, then don't do it. Don't ask me, Alan. Alan. No, it's it, that's reassuring to me that that someone as smart as Vargas doesn't do it either, but I, I it doesn't change my practice, and I, I don't like to say anything's wrong. I don't like to be hard line about things. Um, some people want gases to get, so far be it for me to tell you what to do. But I, I much rather just look and see how the person's doing. And I'll tell you, there are plenty of patients I've taken care of on non-invasive. I didn't get a single gas, and they look better in front of me, and. There's no need to get a gas. They're they're better. I don't know what I'm gonna do with that information. If it looks worse, I'm still gonna keep doing what I'm doing. And if it looks good, I'm not gonna run around the emergency room or ICU bragging. Uh, maybe I'll brag a little bit, but you know. But I wouldn't I wouldn't put a patient through an APG just for that. All right, what other questions do you got? Do you guys have anything at all? It doesn't have to be related to this. You're probably gonna hang out for like another ten minutes. I'm gonna try and keep these really short and focused. By the way, if uh, if you haven't subscribed to the YouTube channel, hook me up. Subscribe to the channel. It helps me out. It'll help you out to stay uh, up to date with any videos that come out. You get pinged. Um, I think it's a good thing, but um, but it's my channel, so I'm selfish that way. But just go ahead and subscribe. It, uh, it does good by the whole YouTube algorithm, and then more people hear content, and then I make more content, and I'm happy. And, and everyone wins. All right, the question section is getting a little dry. So um, I'm going to hang out for a couple more minutes. I do want to give a shout out, though. Um, a shout out to, to my homeboy, John Greenwood. Um, John Greenwood is an intensivist, an emergency medicine doc over at, a, at another institution. But he's been doing this thing called Presser Dex for a couple years. And it is a pretty uh, badass little guide. It 
is really what you need in a crunch. You flip through the page and says, you know, how do I reverse anticoagulation? Um, hypernatremia, what am I going to do for that? And it's quick, it's simple. A lot of great authors who are on this book. And uh, because I uh, was an editor for it, they sent me a copy and it was sitting here. And I figured I'm just going to give a big shout out to John Greenwood and all the hard work. Um, Lillian Emlett, who's an amazing uh, intensivist as well, and Mike Winters down at the University of Maryland, also an ED critical care guy, are also on this fourth edition. I think I've done all the editions as an editor on this book, and I, I think it's a phenomenal book. And um, I'm going to see, before you go out, and see if I can get a, a discount code for you folks because you people are good for following me, and I appreciate that. All right. Ned Kelly says, I've heard the peep from high flow only works when the patient has their mouth closed. What do you think? Thank you, Ned. That is absolutely true. And because I was so hyped up on espresso, I didn't mention that. 100% true. To get the benefits of high flow and, frankly, a lot of the other benefits of dead space washout, you want to make sure that the patient's keeping their mouth closed. If the person's a mouth breather or chatting it up with their friends or, or yelling at the nurse, you want to make sure that they keep their mouth closed. It keeps the ED a lot quieter. But also, you have to generate that positive pressure. So their mouth is closed. The air can go back to the hypopharynx and generate the positive pressure. So have them keep their mouth closed. That is a great question. And thank you for reminding me. Um, totally forgot to bring that up. All right. Oh, I like this name. Giovanni. Giovanni. Do you keep non-invasive as pre-oxidation method for intubation? I do. If I'm, It's already on the person and we're going to intubate, then I'll do it. The truth is, is that when we go to intubate a lot of these patients uh, with ARDS, pneumonia, COVID, what happens is, is you take a person who's spontaneously breathing, they're generating a lot of negative inspiratory pressure in their lungs, you sedate them, you paralyze them, and they de-recruit their lungs. And remember that, that FRC, that functional residual capacity, you're gonna lose your time of apnea. So when you're looking to look for the cords and trying to pass that tube, they're going to start desatting on you. So by using non-invasive, you keep them inflated. And then right at the point when you're going to go to take a look with the laryngoscope, then you can take the mask off. So I'm a big fan of that using non-invasive for these patients. The other things since we're talking about safe practices for intubation, I really like to keep my patients upright as I'm sedating them, what happens is, is that we go to intubate them, we lay them flat, we're all preparing, do we get the suction, do we get this, do we get that, and the patient's laying flat. They're de-recruiting their lungs every second that they're laying flat. So I keep them elevated. I keep them elevated even after pushing the meds. In fact, I try to intubate them sitting up if I can. Um, there's evidence that that has better outcomes, better first pass success, but also prevents them from de-recruiting the lungs. But if I can't intubate them sitting up, at least, even when they're paralyzed, then I lay them flat. So I wait the full minute for circulation time with the non-invasive on, then I lay them flat, and then I go to intubate. I find less de-recruitment. I mostly find less drops in the saturation when I do that technique. So thank you for that question, Giovanni. All right. All right, my man, Dr. Morale, who's, by the way, he is the reigning Resus X champion from the Resus X Olympics from last year. This dude, we had a competition, three rounds, three rounds, and people have to do intubation, central lines, IO placements, look with ultrasound. We, we had all, the, all these participants, and this guy crushed the competition, so much so that he had the record for record time in uh, the final heat. I mean, it was the first time we ever did it, so there's there was no times before that, but still, he has the record now, and he is the reigning champion. And because there's no resus X happening this year, he gets to hold it for two years in a row. It's pretty awesome. And look, he's flaunting the fact that he got a medal by putting three medals. He is not a humble person, but he is the resus X champion. All right. Do you know the difference between high flow cannula and high velocity nasal cannula? I heard a few different things, but not sure about it. I haven't heard this high velocity nasal cannula unless I'm missing some other trade name for it. Um, I certainly look though. Um, traditionally, we talk about high flow nasal cannula, and I wonder if it's the same thing, just another company using it. If anyone's on this thread, got 25 people. If anyone knows, please comment below. Um, I'd be really interested. Otherwise, I'm going to hit Google. When I'm done, 
Um, awesome. Uh, Alan. Alan was there at the Resus Olympics. He was there at Resus X and uh, last year, and we had a good time. Alan, by the way, is a snazzy dresser if you ever see him in person. For whatever reason, um, he wears like these sequin suits. I mean, you thought I was fancy for wearing this imperial Russian thing? Alan came to Resus X in a red sequin suit. He paid $80 on Amazon for it. I thought that was pretty impressive. This was like 20 bucks from a thrift store. But I feel like royalty when I wear it. All right. Any more questions? Hit me with some stuff. Hit me with some stuff. Oh, I forgot. I forgot. Because you all came out, I'm going to um, do a little discount for um, the online Resus X. I don't know if any of you got it, but um, the Resus X online package is digital. It's the three days of lectures that we did last year. Um, Scott Weingart, Salim Rezaei, um, Alan was on it. You can watch the Resus Olympics on there. Evie Marcolini. Um, who else was there? Oh, geez. So many people were on there. Rory Spiegel was there. Go to recessx.com and check it out. Anyway, my point is, is that if you use the discount code live at five, which I'm going to do right after I get off here, um, 50% off. How do you like that? Just 50% off. Boom. Just for being here, just for showing up. And, um, just do that. It's uh, the lectures have been great, and uh, I've been streaming a couple of them. But to get the whole thing, the whole package, half off, live at the number five. I'll do it both ways, just in case. Live at number five or F I V E. Jacques, who helped me earlier the day with a sound check. So thank you, Jacques or Jacques. I apologize if I'm mispronouncing your name but I do appreciate you. Do you choose to start at a higher FIO2 and titrate down or lower FIO2 and, in, and increase as needed? I just start high. I start big and then I bring it back down. If I have somebody who's so sick that I'm starting them on therapy, I like to start higher and then lower them down. I don't know if there's like a playbook about that if there's been prospectively studied. I don't think so, but that's my move. I try to start off high get them out of their trouble, and then bring them back down to normal. And I do it rel relatively aggressive. I'm not waiting hours and hours and hours before I start titrating down, but I, I ask them to start high. Some patients can't tolerate the high flow that high right off the bat, so you may have to come down a little bit. But I look at respiratory failure when these patients present in the emergency room or even in the ICU as a stopwatch. That person, I meet them, the stopwatch goes off. And the stopwatch indicates their muscle fatigue. The longer I wait and the more I'm slow with my therapies, the more their muscles are fatiguing. And once they fatigue, you can't get them back. So I like to get ahead of them, start off aggressively, and then pull back. That's always been my mindset, whether it's an asthmatic, COPD patient, um, pulmonary edema. These are people I know that their muscles are fatiguing, and I have to be maximally aggressive right when I meet them. So a very long-winded way of saying, go big or... Go to the next patient. No, don't go to the next patient. Just be aggressive. Um, I think that's the, the best way of starting off first. Now, with non-invasive, I might start with kind of moderate settings. I might not start with like 25 over 5. I think that's 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 a lot of pressure. I might start with more moderate, like 10 over 5 or maybe a 15 over 5, depending on how the person looks, and then scale it back down. Um, but for high flow, I, I like to start off really high. All right, 30 minute lecture with a 10 minute delay. Sorry about the technical difficulties. We're getting better at doing these lectures, but I think, except for the YouTube thing, I think I got a formula down. So if there are no more questions, I'm gonna say thank you for tuning in. Thank you, Ned Kelly, I appreciate that. Thank you for tuning in. Like I said, if you haven't subscribed to the channel, please subscribe to the channel. Um, going to have a new Crit Bits on Monday, some more content this weekend. I'm working on a couple of different things, um, a new educational website that will be out very, very soon. Some of the people who are involved in it are watching this right now, and I promise you it's going to be it's going to be a pretty big addition to critical care resuscitation education. I hope so. That's not me saying it. It's knowing who's involved with it. They're going to make it great. 
And so I'm excited for that uh, very multimedia way of doing education. And don't forget about the this thing. I'll try and get you all a discount. And then Resusx 50% off. That's that's a lot. That's a lot off. It's like more than 25% off. That's double of 25%. That's 50% off live at five. I'm only going to do it for this weekend for people who watched. So uh, the code is live at five. Here, I'll type it in. You're welcome, everyone. For those of you saying thank you, you guys are so polite. Live at five. Or we're going to do live at five either way you get 50 percent off the digital package at prop for this weekend then i'll just go back it's not like it's crazy expensive the other way but you guys are good people why not you deserve it you've been working hard people michael bonk's on here what's up michael bonk how's it going one of my new colleagues where i work he's a great dude and I just never get to bump into him to hang out. But he's the, you meet him, and he's like the type of guy you know you would hang out with if you ever hung out. And now with COVID, like no one's hanging out. But thanks for showing up, Mike Bonk. People, I hope you have a good weekend. Really nice to see you. Watch The Great on Hulu. It is a phenomenal series. I love it. So good. And then you'll walk around your house dressed like a Russian king. <laughs>